much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome Monday night to the next session in the uh, of the, the coaching conference. I'm just looking at the numbers as everyone's uh, coming through, so we'll just give everybody uh, uh, another minute just to uh, to log on. The remaining two there, but uh, lots already uh, joining us. Uh, so it looks like the uh, the numbers slowing down, so it looks like the majority of uh, uh, people are coming in. Although then uh, it takes another kick as I say that there's a few more uh, jump on, and uh, we've had another really good response, um, and lots of people signing up for this. So uh, uh, it's promising to be a really good and really interesting session this evening. And uh, just a quick reminder, if you haven't already uh, signed up as well, there's, uh, on, on Thursday evening there is uh, Coaching and COVID uh, Assessment and Precautions uh, that will be taking place again at half past seven. Um, if you've registered already for that, um, you'll get uh, the link for Zoom um, the, the day before it will be sent out. Uh, it will be sent out from Denise at uh, SOA, so uh, keep an eye out for that one. Um, and likewise, same thing again next Monday evening uh, on the 18th, we've got Safety for Coaches. Um, again, that will come out via, uh, that will be a Zoom link that will, that will come out. Um, also next week, a couple more, the Junior Squad uh, Coaching Practices and Experiences that we through go to webinar on. Tuesday um, and then we've uh, another one next uh, Thursday as well with additional support needs in orienteering coaching and uh, that'll be through Zoom um, as well so another uh, packed couple of weeks uh, ahead. I think uh, we are it's looking really good with the numbers and it's uh, half past seven now I'll make it 31 so um, I'll just uh, also manage Peter Brook um, British orienteering and just to say thanks for everyone for joining us this evening uh, thanks to Paul and Mark for uh, delivering this session uh, for us and for everyone. And um, like I say it'll be a really good session. If you have, um, if you want to ask questions during the session, um, there should be a, a floating box that appeared, and there might be a, there should be a little um, uh, an orange box with a white white arrow in there. If you open that up, it will give you the function to be able to uh, ask questions. Um, if you go in the question box and, uh, and type in your question as you go along. Um, we will slot it in and um, ask ask your question during uh, at the relevant point. Um, but also, if we needed to explain a bit more as well, we'll uh, unmute you and um, be able to uh, to ask it uh, verbally as well. That should hopefully help us uh, as we go through. So yeah, do any questions on there? I'll be monitoring them, uh, and I will pop back up as, as we go along. But uh, for now, I will pass you over to um, Paul, and uh, we'll speak soon. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that, Peter. I'm uh, I'm I'm trying to <laughs> work with the technology here. Just have to excuse me slightly. I've, I'm used to uh, Teams and and Collaborate Ultra, but this is the first time that we've uh, that I've used um, GoToWebinar. So you have to bear with me if there's uh, one or two one or two issues uh, to work through here. Um, Okay, so I'm just looking to share the slides here. Okay, can I just check with you, Peter, that you can see that okay? Yep, all good. All right, excellent, good stuff. Okay, thank, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a, a a double act, the Murgatroyd and Nixon show, and we're um, we're, we're going to work it as a bit of a tag team tonight. So I'm going to set the scene. I'm going to kick kick us off with um, talking through the aims and 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 some of the early material, which will probably take us around about 10 to 15 minutes. And then uh, I'm, I'm going to pass over to Mark, who who's doing the the central part around um, revisiting 
some of the material you talked about, I think it was about four years ago, a couple of conferences ago around systematic orienteering and some of the developments that, that he's uh, worked on with that. And then we're going to come back to myself just to kind of round everything up and make a few summary points um, for, again, the last 10 to 15 minutes. So we're, we're anticipating this probably taking about an hour. Um, fingers crossed. We, we hope not to overrun too much. And then this that will allow us uh, possible possibility of, of some time for questions at the end as well as questions through. Um, Peter, I... Uh, I'm just looking at my screen at the moment. I'm, I think I've got problems with seeing any questions that pop up. So if there's something that's coming in and you think it's appropriate, if you just want to uh, give me a nudge, tell me what the question is, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pause at that point. Um, otherwise, we'll save, save the questions to the end. Is that OK? Yeah, not a problem. Cool, good stuff. OK, so um, the... The aims of this evening, we're, we're going to talk through a number of things here. We're going to talk about, firstly, what Mark and I perceive as, as the main issues for coaching practitioners within our sport currently. Um, we're going to look at some of the discussions we had from the get-go of us working together. We started working with the talent squad back in 2014. And uh, in the early days, we, we spent a lot of time discussing what we felt were the, the main issues affecting um, junior development, um, junior participation within our sport and how we were going to overcome those within a long-term athlete development approach. We're going to share our, our experiences of, of the development then subsequently over this six-year period and of, of what we've, we've come up with as a, a talent squad system. And hopefully you'll find that not just of interest, but we're, we're going to also talk about how we might look to apply this total orienteering approach we're going to discuss this evening to your own coaching whether that's within a club setting or if you're working with regional squads or you're working as a personal coach with individual athletes so um whilst we we hope that you you find a lot of what we do uh, interesting per se we we hope towards the end that we can give put this into context and give you lots of ideas to take away for for the future when we start back up um, coaching, hopefully in the not too distant future. And, and also a little bit of a summary at the end to talk about um, some of the issues that COVID have obviously presented us with, this pause we've got in our sport, but also the opportunities it presents to have a bit of a, a rethink about what we're doing within the sport and think about how we're going, when we do start back up, how we're going to overcome some of these issues and maybe maybe apply some of the material that we're talking about tonight. Um, so as I say, when Mark and I started working together back in, in 2014, we spent a lot of time as we were setting the system up and thinking about how we're going to deliver this program to the juniors of what were the key issues affecting us. And, and I think much of this is still um, problematic for us. Um, so the, f the first problem we discussed was is the fact that, that many clubs within the UK tend to have an event rather than a training focus. So I think of, of other sports I've worked within, if you think about things like athletics, road racing, a lot of um, people are involved in, in that sport, for instance, they spend a lot of their time training and not so much of their time competing, maybe you know, a 90, 90, 10, 80, 20 split. And so they might only race once a month, once every couple of months, and I identify some key races, 10Ks, whatever that they're going to target. And then they spend a lot of time training and building towards that. Whereas in our sport, we tend to have this event focus with our, with our clubs, where clubs pour a lot of time and energy into putting on events at the weekend or midweek series. And there isn't that much of a training focus that goes along with, with many clubs um, within the UK. And therefore, few clubs dedicate time and energy to recruiting newcomers to bring in whether that whether that's juniors or just general participants recruiting newcomers into the sport and then thinking about how are they introducing that sport how are they training these individuals to become better at that sport um, so we've got some isolated examples of, of, of some clubs who do do that and I can think um, at the moment a club like SYO that's had a um, a great period of recruiting, particularly juniors from local schools, uh, building on the success of their school league, 
and actually now having a, a regular club training program. But that's a, an example that um, is not necessarily unique, but it doesn't happen that often around the clubs within the UK. And, and often when we see training happening, it tends to be one of two extremes. It tends to be either isolated skill sessions, so go off into a forest, we hang a load of kites and we do a, an isolated skills exercise on uh, taking compass bearings. We might do a simplification exercise. We might do, do contour only. And then at the end of that, we say, right, you've got the skills, away you go. And we expect on the back of that, that these newcomers, these juniors will be able to automatically put all these things together and become good orienteers. And inevitably what we see is they understand, so for instance, with the compass bearing exercise, by the end of it, they understand what a compass bearing is and they understand how to take a compass bearing. But they don't necessarily think about, well, if, if I'm now going into a course, when do I take a compass bearing and why am I taking it at that point? And then at the other end of the spectrum, we see a lot of club training based around um, whole courses. So for instance, I think of my own club, um, before we started club night, we would have, say, a typical spring series where we'd have, say, three courses on an evening. Newcomers would come along. They might get a little bit of guidance. They're thrown into a course. It's a little bit of a sink or swim approach. And we hope they have a good experience. They learn stuff from that and they enjoy it and come back in the future, um, which can be a bit of a risky strategy. And so we, we've got these, these two polar ends of the spectrum and the 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 join between these is sometimes not present at all or it's a little bit hazy if it exists um we talked about regions and obviously regions ebb and flow there are periods where some regions have a lot of juniors coming through um they're very fortunate they're a cluster of volunteers and and some very skilled coaches come on board and they go great guns for a while and then everything changes volunteers drop out, coaches leave the sport, leave the area, and their, their junior resource drops off. So we have this kind of sporadic, some regions are, are strong, some regions are not so strong, some regions very active, others not so. So again, it leads to a bit of an inconsistent picture in terms of junior development across the UK. And then um, one, of, one of the key issues for us um, over the last few years is how many of the athletes coming into the squad have a dedicated, knowledgeable personal coach? Because realistically, we can only do so much with the squad, given our time, our resources, etc. And so it's really important that all the juniors who come into the squad have a personal coach. And when they come in, we talk to them about that. And often they either don't have a coach or they, they don't know where to, to access a coach. Or if they have a coach, um, it might just be somebody who is helping them out on an occasional basis and it's not really regular contact. Some of them say, well, my mum or my dad is my coach, um, which can work, but obviously can cause issues from time to time. Um, and there's also the, the knowledgeable aspect of it. So a lot of juniors may have a coach who is very comfortable working within an orienteering technical domain, but maybe is less comfortable when they start to branch out and start talking about giving advice around physical training or mental skills acquisition, that kind of thing. Um, and all of these issues lead to the end result where we see junior athletes coming into the squad with a range of abilities, but with lots of significant gaps often in their knowledge base. And so what we started to do was, once we know with what we're working with, we then started over the last six years to devise what we hope is a fairly robust system of athlete education, athlete development that, that starts to fill in some of these gaps and ultimately takes them from the national stage to not just competing on the international stage, but actually doing well and enjoying that experience on the international stage. So what, we, what we've what we developed over the last few years is, is what we call the Total Orienteering Programme. And that has three levels. So we've got the macro strategy, the micro strategy and the tactical approach. So I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about these first two levels, and then I'm gonna pass over to Mark to talk about the tactical approach, which is where his systematic orienteering model comes in.
So if we start from the macro strategy, whenever um, an athlete comes into the squad for the first time or they uh, come back to us for another season, what we do at the end of a, end of a season is we sit down with each athlete and we look at this holistic athlete development plan and we say to each of them, right, um, let's review in conjunction with your personal coach, if you have one, um, where, where are you at? Where are your strengths? Where, what do you think you're doing well as an athlete? Where are the gaps in your knowledge? What, what are the shortcomings within your skill set? And we look at each of these athlete domains, and, and I've, I've talked about this at previous conferences in terms of these are the elements that we try to develop across the program on a, a regular cyclical approach. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of today's talk. So often an athlete will come to us and it might be that they're naturally gifted as a, as a runner. Maybe they come from a running background, they've got running coach, their physical domain is really strong, but they haven't had that much te technical and tactical support. Uh, and so we need to do a lot of work on their orienteering skill sets. Um, it might be that they are struggling with injuries, they don't really understand how to recover, um, they maybe don't really have physio support, they're not doing any strength and, and conditioning work, they're running mechanics of poor. So we'd work at, at look at some of these other domains and start filling in those gaps. So we make a plan of, of action for them. And what we're trying to do here in the macro strategy is get the athlete to understand what can I do well, what do I continue to need to do well, and what are my shortcomings, and what are these gaps I need to fill in in my knowledge. So that, that's starting at the top level with the athlete. Then we go, then we come to the micro strategy. So we've got two athletes here. Um, both, both guys in 2019 were part of the um, men's relay team uh, that, that got onto the podium, the first J Watt podium for, for quite some time, over 20 years. Um, and Ali was our third leg runner. Freddie Carcass on the right was, was our uh, leadoff runner in that relay but two very different athletes. And so what we've, what we've done with these two athletes and is we, um, over the years we've worked with them, we've, we've sat down each season and said, right, where are you at? What, 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 is, what, is your, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? So if we think about Ali, um, we know that he's technically, he's very robust. Um, he comes from a strong club in, in, um, in the lakes with good technical areas and he's developed a very robust, solid technique. We know that he is strong physically, he's got good endurance, he works well through terrain, which is typical of someone who's coming from the lakes. Maybe he lacks a little bit of top end speed and that's something that we've worked on with him. Um, mentally, he's a very consistent racer. If you look at his international results, it, regularly throughout his junior career, he gets top 20s. Um, and, he, and he's, 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 he is Mr. Consistent when it comes to international racing and he's very solid mentally. So we know that's, that's his skill set. That's his, if you like, his macro strategy. Freddie's very different. He's come from a different background. Uh, he's come from an athletics um, running background. Physically, he's a great specimen. He's probably at Jaywalk in 2019, one of the top three or five runners who, would, who were at Jaywalk. Um, so he's very quick, which makes means that when he when he um, competes in races involving things like sprint or relay, he's he he shines. He comes to the fore. However, um, technically, he's not as robust as Ali. He tends to uh, he tends to struggle a little bit more with nerves. So his performance, both mentally uh, and technically, is a little less robust than Ali. So we know what their strengths and what their, their weaknesses are. Now, when we think about micro strategy, this is when we start to prepare for races. So if it's a, na a national selection race, um, or if it's an overseas international, we're sitting down with these guys and we're saying, right, how are you taking your strengths and applying it to a particular race? So this micro strategy of, let's say for instance, you're racing uh, a selection race at Graithwaite, um, what are the demands of that area? And how are you going to maximize your strengths to overcome the challenges of that area and make sure that your weaknesses are not going to hold you back and compromise your performance? So someone like Ali in Graithwaite may look at, for instance, a long leg and go, 
I'm going to take this straight. I'm strong through terrain. I trust my skill set. And straight for me is great, works. Whereas for Freddie, he might well look at the long leg, same long leg, and go, actually, there's a couple of track routes which are off the red line. I'm going to beast, get out to the track, use my top end speed to beast down the track, and then come in off a strong attack point and minimize the, the need for me to spend time in the map slowing myself down. So that's that macro strategy applied to the micro level. Okay, and then once we've gone from that, these guys are then thinking, I've prepared for this race, I know what my strategy is for this, this race in this area, and I'm now thinking about, I'm on the start line, what am I, what's my tactical approach for this race? And this is where Mark comes in with, with, his, um, with his systematic orienteering approach, as we start to think about, irrespective of their grand strategy, each of them needs to do the same thing leg after leg after leg. So it's this consistency of approach. So I'm going to change over now to Mark, and he's going to look to take you through the um, systematic orienteering approach. Thanks, Paul. Do you want to um, select the change presenter and then I'll share my screen and then we can get moving on? Here we go. So just give me a few seconds. Can you just confirm that we're on uh, my presentation view now? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, thanks a lot. So, uh, good question. What is good orienteering? Um, what I'm about to present, we normally deliver to our athletes over a summer camp, uh, three technical uh, weekends, and a second spring camp. So it's a it's a lot to get through. I'm going to try and keep it to <laughs> under 40 minutes, which is still. Uh, taking us through pretty much to the end of the seminar. So it will be brief and hopefully I can uh, give you just some of the key points uh, that we try and try and deliver. Um, one of the main, well, the purpose that we we sort of came to this sort of total orienteering or systematic, as Paul said, is um, there's no such thing as the right way to orienteer. We're all different athletes with different strengths and weaknesses, but perhaps we can develop uh, almost like a, a checklist that we go through, similar to like maybe a pilot before takeoff asking ourselves the same questions on every leg in any type of terrain um, and if we answer these questions correctly then we're going to be successful on that leg now the answers will be different depending on the terrain and depending on the athlete um, but the actual uh, the checklist of going through it that should um, hopefully remain um, the same so i'm just going to move some things and hopefully we can get going okay so what are we trying to achieve um, now, obviously, orienteering is a sport. It's also a hobby for most. Um, in terms of the talent squad, obviously, it's competition. Okay, that's that's what we're trying to do, and therefore, the fastest possible time. That is the overall goal. Um, okay, well, how do you have the overall fastest time? Well, it, it's quite a simple formula. Uh, you want to run the shortest distance at the highest possible pace. Quite straightforward. That's how you get a good time. Um, shortest optimal distance is obviously not necessarily the shortest distance. You can't just sit on the red line um and run as fast as you can and and that's going to be the best thing for you so it's so optimal distance is something we're going to talk about later and i think we all should understand that concept of what is shortest optimal and what is shortest and then fastest possible pace um yeah you get those two things sorted um and hopefully you have a good time so it's it's quite simple in that respect it's not easy but it is uh quite simple so when you think about that, I boil that down to some certain key factors to actually having good performance. We need to be able to select the best route choice for us. Very important to understand that, as Paul sort of um, talked about earlier, different athletes, the route choice will be different. Um, so it's understanding what the best route choice is for us. Well, we can do that. And we can move on to running that route choice without adding any extra time. OK, and that comes down to two things. Avoiding adding extra distance by deviating from our, our line. And then avoiding slowing down, either due to uh, some uncertainty or hesitation, or um, taking bad lines, by which I mean uh, poor runnability. Um, that's going to slow you down. Okay, those are really the things to to focus on. It's uh, not massively, again, not massively complicated, but when you boil down it, so there's lots of things to start to consider. And we're thinking about selecting the best route choice for us. I don't want to dwell too long on route choice because I think it's one of the more simplistic uh, things of what we do. Um, 
but we will go through it. Um, sorry, I'm that slide wrong. So, selecting the best route choice. Well, how do we do that? Well, the first stage, it's quite straightforward, but you'd be surprised how many people don't necessarily do this as often or even at all. You need to read the map. Okay, that's the first thing we do. Um, and when you're reading the leg, uh, certain things are going to pop out to you. You're going to, depending on the terrain, you might just naturally see there's going to be areas or lines of runnability things might jump out at you or it might be the opposite there might be areas or lines of resistance places you can and can't go so if i put a map up hopefully we can all see that um i've tried to zoom in on them so the scale is pretty decent um if you're on a mobile device uh that's probably not going to work um already that should have been enough time for you to make a very quick decision about where you're going this is clearly a leg to go straight okay um even if you're very late on coming into control number four, you should be able to just glance at that leg, instantly go, it's white, I'm going straight. Um, there might be other legs where you, you glance at it and you can see, oh, okay, yeah, there's some green going on. Uh, might have to think a little bit about where I go. And, and so the resistance, the, the, the slow areas or the tough areas are gonna crop out. Um, also things to consider, areas you literally cannot go, out of bounds, olive green, things like that, you might have to run through. Um, obviously anything that according to your mapping specification um, is going to be resistant and so again on legs like this the road should jump out at you your eyes should be drawn to that there's a nice line there's green and then there's a line um, of runnability that goes through that that happens really really quickly if you spent time looking at maps that won't be complicated now in sprint it's a little bit different in the forest we might depending on the forest but we might go in with the strategy of well i'm pretty much going to go straight um, unless there's a reason to go around, especially in middle distance, especially nice terrain. In sprint, we know almost certainly you can't go straight. There's going to be something in the way. And so our vision goes slightly different. Our vision is starting to look wider, OK, because we know there's going to be obstacles. There's obviously a lot of rules and features about what you can and cannot cross. Um, so our expectancy should be slightly different. Sprint and forest already is quite different and then different types of terrain it can be quite simple or it can start to get quite complicated. There's numerous blocks where you cannot get through. Now, sprint is quite binary in the sense that generally runnability is fairly equal everywhere. Obviously, exceptions, um, but generally you can expect a, a fairly equal runnability. Um, and then there's these obstructions, buildings, olive green, uh, impassable walls, fences, uh, vegetation, and stuff like that. Um, and then you're having to find clear ways to get through those. So in sprint, you can have quite simple controls. Um, but again, simple does not mean easy, where there's clearly nothing resistance. You look online, a glance and that. Whenever you happen to have looked at that in advance, 19, you should just make a decision straight away. OK, it's clearly going straight. Um, the, the pond is clearly you need to go around to the left. OK, it's not bisected equally um, and you wouldn't dictate, uh, dedicate really uh, any time to that. So those are the things you might look at in terms of runnability or lack of runnability. That might pop out also technically challenging areas or the opposite, technically safe areas. This is a leg from first first control from World Championships middle. If you look along the straight line, there's some green, it's a little bit vague, okay. But if you swing round to the left, depending when you come off the track, you can avoid the green, you can come up a nice big attack point, you could potentially come up the path, or you can swing low on the hill and in the big re entrant. That's where the fastest time was run, okay swinging around straight, people disappeared off to the right, people were making mistakes, lack of visibility early on in the course as well. Here's another example um, as well, a uh, long distance for the same World Championships. When you start looking at things are gonna jump out to you. So hopefully the marsh is really quite obvious. Hopefully the fact that a lot of that map sample is quite green. Um, you might look at the control fitting out, oh, open marsh. Well, actually the control site's gonna be quite easy. An open marsh in green forest should stand out. There should be a lot of daylight there. The track, okay, clearly there's a track option. And these, these things are starting to jump out at you, okay? All that information is gathered very, very quickly, okay? Um, you then have to identify viable routes. So really on this leg, there's two, okay? Out to the path and in, or going vaguely straight. You could potentially go left of the line, but um, for me, the, the straight option is that slightly right uh, of the line. Now, in terms of shortest distance, really, it's not distance is what we're calculating. We're, we're, we're measuring how far it is with our eyes, and then we're also applying a sort of runnability factor to that. So we know the path route is going to be option. Uh, path option is going to be longer, but we also know it's going to be faster. And then you just have to make 
a calculation which one of those if run correctly is going to be quicker that's that's what you have to decide it can be quite difficult um, and based on your experience in that terrain but that's really the, the calculation you have to make but you also have to estimate the risk so leg uh, sorry a route could be quicker but if you're only going to do that 10 percent of the time is it worth the risk okay so that's another factor that you you need to understand um, in a lot of terrain straight might be an option if you can do it um, but we need to understand what our own strengths and weaknesses are now that takes a little bit longer seeing the roots might be one step might be quite quick but then making that calculation might take a little longer um, this is just something that comes with experience the easiest way to train this is, is to do it um, and after that you obviously have to make the decision which way am i going um, so selecting the best route choice for us there's things to think about you've calculated that estimated time okay you work out how far you think it is how far it's going to run you're not literally doing the math you just make a decision it goes on instinct things to consider when you're doing that what are the demands of the leg also what are my abilities what are my weaknesses and then technically as we said earlier well what's the risk and, and that really comes down to well the technical demands of the leg and then what are my technical strengths and weaknesses and you're balancing all that all that up so people may be familiar with the term SWOT analysis simply a ma uh, matching your strengths and weaknesses both physically and technically and aligning them with the opportunities and threats in the in the terrain and Paul used some examples earlier to athletes where one of them may be more technically gifted more physically dominant in the terrain is going to go straight one of them who's got upper end speed um, doesn't quite have the same like technical skill set well they're going to go for that round option uh, using the tracks tracks using more solid route choice but the questions are the same they've got to make the same calculations but come to very different uh, decisions so route choice heuristics it's very important to understand you're making decisions with incomplete or inaccurate data okay so things like the runability of the terrain um, there is obviously mapping standards but the runability of the terrain will change uh, the visibility of the terrain so through the terrain or the visibility of features that's going to that's going to change that might uh, make the more technical legs harder to do is the map accurate is it up to date it's like elephant tracks might appear which will completely change the game control might be placed in a visible or less visible location there's, there's loads of reasons why when you're making a decision you're not exactly going to have all that available information so you have to make what you think is best um, now, on route choice, it's quite important that the map presents the most accurate information. This is something that in the UK is poor. Okay, mapping in the UK is poor. The IOF mapping guidelines have quite specific rules, both in Sprint and in Forest, about the runability in terms of speed for white, light green, medium green, and dark green. Um, however, I've run in that third level green, so the medium green. I've been going below four minute Ks in that, in a JK. Now, that does affect route choice. Um, it's not much you can do about that. That comes down to experience. You need to know the map that you're running on. You need to know that in some places, white is going to be significantly slower than medium green. You just have to know that, and that's experience. But that's going to affect that calculation. Okay, so route choice. Um, select the best one for us. Okay, so that's involving all those equations, working out what's going to take me the quickest you can practice that um world of over to christmas very good example of that you don't get to actually execute the leg but you can ask yourself those questions and that's something that during covid hopefully a lot of people have been getting involved with at least doing the the decision part of navigation without doing the execution part so actually the the hard bit is then running that route without adding any extra time so we discussed how actually extra time can either come from adding extra distance you're deviating from that line that you've chosen or you're having to slow down having to stop um or you're you're getting caught in, in, in slow running areas you're losing time so if we think about um so i've formatted these really badly i apologize obviously just copied and pasted the slide so <laughs> avoiding extra distance <laughs> so um a route choice is not a plan. And this is probably the most common, the most significant mistake uh, and the cause of the, the majority of time loss that I see with athletes in the talent squad. Um, that their fundamental skill set is normally all right. And, and I think, um, you know, they, they know how to take compass bearings. They understand that, that depending where they're from, they, 
more or less skilled at interpreting interpreting detail on the map and contours and things like that but quite often they pick a route choice and then just try and run it a route choice is, is no more than just essentially a line on the map that red line or blue line we saw from the leg example if someone asks you oh which 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 route did you go on that leg you went oh i, I went straight oh I, I went around the path and that's not that's not a plan is it going around the path it's where you went but but, but a plan is more like a recipe it's, it's steps i'm going to do x y z it, a plan you should be able to give it to another person and they can go and execute that leg as well um so you need to ask yourself some questions like okay where are you going um okay i'm going to go out to the path i'm going to run along the path uh, how long for what are you going to see when you're going to come off the path um and then how are you getting out to the path are you following a feature to the path are you using your compass um so asking those questions where am i going what am i going to see and how am i going to get there um and then what makes a good plan well it needs to cover the whole leg the common mistake we also see is very good detailed plans at the start and by the end they tend to drift drift off just sort of get to the attack point and then just find the control um very common um, plans just start to disintegrate towards the end um it's important that you have detail at the the crucial moments the cruxes when's it going to be difficult when do you need detail obviously around the control but potentially in the middle of the leg there could be key areas where you're, you're transitioning between technical patches you need more information However, a good plan also uh, doesn't overcomplicate things. It's simple when it's safe. Okay, you don't need to to over navigate. If you're leaving a patch of woods to maybe a crossroads, and so you can drift left or drift right, but you're going to get caught by a, a funnel of paths, a crossroads of paths. You don't really need to be navigating particularly to get out there. You can just be running on rough compass and moving quite quickly. So a good plan is also simple when uh, when it can be. So starting with a solid plan. So the plan is absolutely everything. That's the most fundamental uh, of, all, of all the skills and, and tactics to me. Plan is essential. You then fill that out with basic skills. Now this is, this little diagram is, is drawn on work that was done by a psychologist called oh, David Eccles, I think his name was, from Durham. He's now at Florida State. Um, and then Chris Jones took this work, did um did a little paper when he was doing his masters on this and then and then we took that up and, and did some more work on it but it's boiling down to like what the simple skills are so planning understanding exactly where you are that step-by-step -step recipe to finding the control your skills are then direction skills this is primarily compass okay there's other ways to get direction using some features but for most purposes we're thinking about compass uh, the next most important set of skills are picture skills this is reading the map and so being able to interpret the map being able to understand what the features mean, um, being able to almost create a picture in your mind, hence why it's called that, and then find it in the terrain, okay? So we've got map to grounds, but we've also got ground to map. So you should be able to look into the terrain and then understand what that would look like if it were drawn, okay? So it goes both ways. We should be generally going map to ground, but you will need to be able to go ground to map as well. And then the fourth sort of basic set of skills is distance and distance judgment. I put them slightly smaller, they're not as important, I believe, but they're a constant backup. Okay, there's a there's basically three ways of doing it. You can have pacing, um, which certainly for talent squad and international level, that that's not really appropriate. Um, but for some people, that's uh, a safe way of doing it. And then the other two ways are using just distance clues, so looking up, understanding what 100 meters look like, what 50 meters look like, what 200 meters looks like, um, and also this sort of timing. And we. It's almost like a, an extra sense distance judgment. You start to get these alarm bells. It's like, oh, it should be around here, it should be soon. Um, and so it, it's a combination really, I think, of taking visual clues um, and an internal timing system, but it comes with practice. All the different skills, all the different training, everything you can think of, all the different tactics and techniques and exercises you can put somewhere on what is not actually a four-way Venn diagram. Um, but the most important things, be able to make a plan, use your compass, read the map and know what it looks like and know if you've gone too far. The main point of distance is actually to know when to start paying attention. So one thing we teach with, um, with the juniors is like, you, you shouldn't expect to come to the end of your distance judgment and the control is at your feet. It, it's a warning system rather than providing the answer. We boil the fundamental skills down, okay? Um, and we try and teach, these fundamental skills earlier in the season and Paul will talk a little bit about that later on. So when you're trying to run in direction, there's going to be accuracy and drift. Okay. If you're trying to run in a straight line, you're going to drift off. Many, many reasons. 
personal error from you in taking the bearing. You physically can't run straight because there's trees. Understanding there's mapping issues in terms of a boulder, the size of a boulder on the map or a pit compared to the size of it in reality. Lots of reasons why you're going to deviate. And that's fine. Um, that's natural. In terms of distance judgment, further you go, the worse that just judgment is going to be. Okay. It's very easy to probably be accurate over 10, 15, 20 meters, but once you start getting into the hundreds, um, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have to sort of measure a K in my mind running through terrain. I'd want to start ticking off way more frequently than that. So when you put those two things together, you're going to try and end up somewhere, probably going to drift, maybe left, maybe right. Your distance judgment is going to be maybe too far forward or, or, or behind you, and you're going to end up somewhere in this zone okay that's where your likely position is you know you're going to be somewhere in there so how does this tie in to planning and orienteering and executing well you need to also understand feature visibility how far can you see certain features from so you think about the pit it's negative it's down into the terrain you're not going to be able to see it from that far compared to a boulder which stands up it's got some height you're going to see it from a much further distance okay now even if we were trying to find the pit it would make way more sense to be aiming for the boulder. Okay, we're going to be able to see it from further away. So we just need to be coming in on compass, aiming to get to a point where we're going to be able to see the feature. Okay, and in this case, that is actually the boulder. It might not be a control, but it's something we're looking for. It's a beacon that we're looking for, and that's how we that's how we find it. And that's how um, that that distance judgment is a warning. It's like, okay, now I need to start looking for the boulder. And when you see the boulder, okay, I'm going to get to the boulder. And when you get close, now I need to start looking for the pit. It's a warning system. Don't expect to just take that bearing and the, the pit's going to appear at your foot. Understand your weaknesses. If you know you can run a very long distance and have a very small deviation, that's great. You need less features. If you know you can't do that, okay, that's fine. Make sure you use more of these beacons along the way. Or you're going to stay on handrails. You're going to stay on line features as much as possible. So minimize that chance of um, where you end up ending outside this and you're going to miss miss your feature so think about okay how do we attach those into a plan so here's a leg okay now everyone hopefully can see that the resolution is a little bit grainy i do apologize um again nice white forest things might be jumping out at you you might see the marsh or the stream that crag on the line towards the control there's some more crags there's the re-entrant just before it there's the null. Things like this should be jumping out. So a very simple representation of the leg. Very simple. It's like that. And the way I'd run it, yeah, I'm going to run pretty much straight. I'm going to aim slightly left so I catch that stream before the crag. I'm going to run down to it. And then from the crag, I'm going to come through the re-entrant and into the control. And if we think about where you can see things from, marsh, yeah, that's going to have decent visibility. Stream, a lot less. Crag, yeah, probably bigger than the stream. Crags are bigger than streams. Maybe a bit of a gap in the middle. Potentially, I've not actually put that other crag on, but and then the null, at the end. Okay, but there's gaps. If I'm stood, if you look at on the left, you're stood in a re-entrant when you're actually at number five. You not you might not be able to see the marsh. If you can't see where you're going, you need to be on compass because you don't know where you're going. Okay. As soon as you can see that feature, oh, it's fine. You don't need to follow your bearing. I can see the end of the marsh. Let's get going. And when you get to the end of the marsh, you're, all, you're going to find the stream, right? They're connected. And so you can run along that. And then you're going to see the crack because they're connected. And then there's another gap. There's this re-entrant. It's a little bit wet. The vegetation might be a little bit thicker. And it's like, okay. I can't actually see really quite where. I can see there's a slope over there, but I can't really see the hilltop. So I need to be on compass again. If you cannot see the feature you're running to, Okay, or traveling to next, you need to be on compass. That's, that's the only reason to be moving is A, I can see where I want to go, or B, I've taken a compass bearing, I've looked up, and I found the feature on that, on that line that I'm going to run to, and I'm going to repeat that process until I can see the feature that I'm looking for next. If, if you can't see the feature and you're not on compass, you're, you're massively running the risk of making a mistake. That is probably the most important message. Okay. You need to either be on compass or have seen a feature. Otherwise, don't move, stop, get yourself sorted, and then start the process again. Okay. So, well, this slide that I've copied and pasted really badly. So, that um, was avoiding extra distance. Okay. So, so, having that plan, I'll just scroll back. That's about being accurate. 
Okay, we, we've not really talked about speed at the moment, but that's about being accurate. Okay, now that's the first step. Now, so for some people, that's enough. That's fine. But also being quick, yeah, that's what we're aiming for in an international team, and for for a lot of people as well. You know, it's like, yeah, I want to be clean, but I want to be fast. So how can we be fast? Um, well, simple answer: When can you run fast? Okay, so there's a few important factors to firstly to understand. Physical fitness will obviously determine how fast you can run. So you should do all the training to turn up in the best shape as you can. That's fine. That's for a different presentation. Um, Runability for the terrain will obviously affect how fast you can run. So that's something that affects your macro route choice we talked about earlier, understanding your strengths, understanding the terrains. But you also need to understand micro route choice. Now, say we're in the forest and we can look up and we can see where we want to be in a few hundred meters time. We can see, oh, there's a big, uh, maybe it's the marsh we we're talking about just now in that previous slide. I can see the marsh down there. Okay. You should then survey the terrain between yourself and that marsh and pick the fastest line. Okay. There's no point running in a perfectly straight line if it's going to take you through slower terrain, brashings and brambles and, and things like that. You should take the fastest line between where you are now and the furthest point you can see where you know you need to end up. This could be using elephant tracks. It could just be using natural lines within the terrain. Um, but that's what micro route choice is. In reality, we never run the exact line we chose. We run down a corridor of least resistance along the route that we have chosen. Okay, but the main factor that really should affect how hard you run is how hard you try and run. Okay, things that might affect that traffic lighting. So it could come down to I could run faster, but we're entering a technical area, so I need to slow down. Could be confidence. You, you could just really start to not know where you are. Your plan's starting to break down. You don't know where you're going. These are the hesitations. Um, there's also tactical reasons. Maybe in a long race, you might want to pace yourself or chasing starts, relays. There's different reasons why you might want to run over speed in certain instances, but we're going to skip that, um, skip that for now. In terms of how, or when you can run fast, run, fa run fast if you know where you're going and you're taking a good line. Okay, so we need to know where we're going. Now, in order to do that, we need to know what to concentrate on. Okay, our attention, then we, Paul, have worked with some psychologists, um, primarily at Edinburgh University, and one of them was talking about attention. You can't really ever turn your attention off. You, you might feel like you're drifting away, but, it, but it's going somewhere else. Okay, your attention or concentration is always focused on something. Your orienteering, it could be reading the map. Okay, a lot of the time it's looking at the map, but hopefully it's reading the map, taking off some useful information. You could be there and you've read the map, and then you're looking in the terrain, you're, you're finding features. For me, this is really what sort of the main part of navigation is. Um, we could be thinking about running. This could be internal. So this could be like pain management, essentially. If you're on a track, it's like, come on, keep pushing, get to the top of that hill. Um, and what could be external focus, and by that I mean um, finding your feet. So if you're in a sprint, for example, and you have to go down a flight of stairs, you should only thing you should be concentrating is putting your feet um, on the steps, not falling over. You shouldn't be thinking about reading the map. You shouldn't be uh, looking up get your foot your feet down and, and that's the same in rough terrain as well there's times when you need to purely focus on, on moving through that terrain um, but that's thinking about okay i'm concentrating on on moving um there's other things that are quite important punching the control control routine control codes very important um other things that might crop up or points or energy controls uh there's there's plenty of others um and also other competitors um and then there's the whole bunch of other distractions. Some of them may be present, so you might hear commentary or there might be a spectator run through. Um, there's competitors who are on your course or not on your course, people you know. There could be um, sort of imaginary distractions, so you might start singing in your head or you might be particularly stressed about something that's completely not related to the orienteering and you're starting to drift off. But it's really important you know what to concentrate on at the right time. It is okay to drift off. Um, that there'll be times when it, it, it's safe, your navigation is fine, you know where you're going and you can slightly drift. But you need to plan that in. So two examples of legs, hopefully brush through these. So this is a leg from Jaywalk. Again, hopefully you're starting to take in that information. Certain things are jumping out at you. Um, there's a big track that's going around the side. Yeah, straight, there's a lot of undergrowth. There's that big white, um, big white hill. Um, for the men, the routes were relatively similar except running over the the hill here was 
majority of the faster times were run that way. Um, there were plenty of people who bailed straight out to the track. We had some went round, and that's not to say that wasn't the fastest time for them. To understand the bias of because the fastest time was run a certain way doesn't mean that was the best route for anyone. Um, then there was kind of straight and then left, left of straight. But the majority of the fastest times for men were over the hill, and then for the women, none of the straight options were good. Um, obviously, female competitors have a slightly uh, less terrain strength just due to, 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 to muscle mass. Um, and so round or nice terrain is obviously generally a better option. Um, and then you think about, okay, what should I be doing and, and, and when? And I would try and break the leg down into sections. Okay, this is clearly a leg where you, it, it's not done in one, it's done in pieces. Um, so I'd maybe think about first point I maybe want to get, to, sorry, that's way too big. All right, I'm going to start drawing. Um, so I might want to try and, that's, it's too big. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> right for a smaller pen okay so we're breaking the leg down so we might want to, if we're going over the hill okay this was the most popular one so you might want to try and get there might be the first step and then get to the end of the hill and then you're really sort of mounting the hill getting onto the track you might think obviously it's important we take um we take off junction as well and then we've got our attack into the control so there's certain key areas we need we need to focus on but eventually, I'd say it's really those three zones, getting to this big track junction, running along the hill, um, just making sure we're coming off in an efficient way, um, and then the path at the end. There's certain times we're just going to be safe. When we're running along the hill, okay, it, we're handrailing the hill. We've got obvious patches either side that are keeping us in. We don't hugely need to be on our compass because the flow of the terrain is in a certain direction. This is safe. This is a good time to either think about running, yeah, and just make some progress or read the map and look at what's coming up ahead. Now, it happened to be a spectator control, um, but you could be starting to look at things ahead this same time. We think about running along the track. That's obviously safe. OK, so you can make some progress. Think about running or you can read the map. Um, you might, I don't know, in the middle, you shouldn't really be taking a gel. But if this was a long, now a track running is a good time to take a gel. Running through stony ground, running up a steep hill is not a good time to take a gel. Um, understanding what you can do when whether the start to me actually looks harder than the finish as long as you're going to come to the top of the hill okay so we're going to have a down slope we should be looking left as soon as we start to go down We've got the track junction um coming up just before it the control shouldn't be that difficult you've also got a building behind it that's almost certainly going to be a garden so there should be a massive piece of daylight shining through the forest there um Ignoring any elephant tracks, depending on when you start, the, the control isn't particularly tricky. The start is, if we're going this way, it's like we come up early and sort of come through, or do we want to go onto this ride, which we know is going to be a forestry? So actually, I, I can see at the beginning, I should be focusing purely on, on getting to that. My, my attention is purely on um, reading the map and then looking in the terrain. I'm not, I'm not worried about running particularly fast. I need to make sure I, I get here first. Understanding when to concentrate and when you can think on other things um okay and then think about i'm gonna have to clear all of that cool on a sprint it's very it's slightly different so here's a hopefully a sprint example um i apologize for this blob um so we look along the red line obviously we can't run straight so hopefully people are starting to see routes see options uh there's basically two um, two macro options. So again, I'm going to start draw the options that we see. So either coming round or coming through here, and doing round the back. Um, I'll tell you that the left one was shorter. It was about four seconds quicker. 44 going left, and I think it was 49 seconds going right were the fastest times on those routes. Now in sprint, a bit more binary. It's a bit more black and white, but there's certain times we need concentrate so we're, when we come around this corner it's really important we're coming around that we're going to get down the path and this is another we need to make sure we hit this corner okay and then we need to make sure we come through this and then as we come through here we should be looking up looking for the statue or cairn or whatever that special feature is going to be there's key moments where we need to focus and in between that it's a bit more safe we can do what we want um this is quite easy navigation okay we're just hand railing a road so again this is time when you can commit to doing something else there's a shorter zone here and there's a shorter zone here and then these two 
are so close together. I really, as soon as I turn that corner, all I'm thinking about is the control. Um, you might see it here, and then you might think about things like maybe checking the code or rechecking your exit as you're coming in. This straight zone, that's a good time to go, okay, I can do other things. Again, on a sprint, really, it's planning ahead. Your choice is navigate. We found the, the zones that we need to navigate. It's the corners when we're, we're trying to actually find the right way. In between that, you can run as fast as you can, or you can dedicate time to planning. Um, we generally recommend that you get as much planning as you can, can early on. Looking at the map does slow you down. It's important to understand that. Um, but yeah, knowing when to run, knowing when to plan, staying ahead of yourself at the same time. I appreciate I'm massively below, uh, behind schedule, but we'll, uh, we'll keep going on. <laughs> it was never going to get done on time. Cool. Um, executing, oh, I need to remove that. Executing at full plate. So simplification is really important. Okay. Um, you need to use minimum number of features. If you have too few, you're going to make mistakes. You might run extra distance. If you have too many features, now you're not going to get lost. You're not going to run extra distance, but you're going to over navigate. Um, you're potentially going to slow down to check things off. Um, reading the map slows you down. Finding, you know, seven attack points on the way to your main attack point is going to slow you down. Um, the consequence is, is way worse for having too few than it is for having too many. Um, but you can try doing both. Just start with lots, remove them, remove them, use fewer and fewer and fewer, and eventually you'll find your breaking point. You go, okay, that's how, that's how many I need on this certain distance. Um, you should compartmentalize the plan, break it down into sections, okay, break that leg up. Some legs, it's just uh, con control to control, so a little uh, control pick, yeah, and you don't really need to break it down, but some you can break into two, three, four, five, six. Leg length is, is not related to how many sort of sections it is. That's just to do with sort of the navigation points. So you can have a very long leg, with not much to do, or the medium leg with actually quite a lot to do. Um, and once you've broken it up, you need to know what's coming up next. What am I doing in the next zone? So when you're in the first part, um, you want to be ready for the second part as you get there, so you can just run through. Okay. Um, and we're just doing that the whole way round the course. If anyone's familiar with the Wallace and Gromit films, there's one where Gromit is on a like a toy train, and he's laying the track down in front of him as he's going. And that's how you kind of need to need to be orienteering. You need to be laying your plan out in front of you as you go along. As you leave the control, you don't need to know every single little thing about the attack point at the end of that leg. That, that's, that's not useful at that moment. But when you get to that attack point, you do. So whilst your route needs to be completed um, as you leave that control, the plan you can build along the way. So just know the next zone. Once you know what's coming up, you head up, look for that feature. And then that allows us to pick the fastest um, line through the terrain um, and if it's sprint that's going to allow you to avoid pedestrians and, and things like that see hazard see there's a car coming up so you're, you're already adjusting things like that being able to take the the fastest line um use those safe sections when when there's, there's nothing that can go wrong use that to pair for the next section so you can run straight through and if that plan expires stop get one and then move on and this is a, a another classic mistake it's like oh i might find it or things are going wrong but it will be all right it, it takes courage to stop to admit i don't know what i'm doing um and the problem is you might find the control in the next 30 seconds but you might not um so you have to make a decision am i going to run out for a minute to a track junction and come back in for a minute and find it versus look around for two minutes and and, and it's very difficult hopefully you don't get to that point you you sense that things are going wrong early but it it's a difficult decision and people tend to go for that oh, i'll probably find it soon People rarely back out, but you need to understand that, that stopping is not wasting time. It's it's investing time. OK, um, right. That's the majority of the, the, the sort of how to orient One thing I want to say is that is not the only way that that's just kind of the way the questions, the way we phrase it, what we teach. There's loads of different ways There's that none of that was facts, just one way of looking at things. Um, so we move on how to we the, the technical analysis of the training as well. Um, now, classic thing, going orienteering doesn't make you good at orienteering. There's a lot of people in this country who need to hear that, okay? Uh, training needs to be purposeful. It needs to have uh, review and improvement, okay? So performance, you're going to go orienteering. You should analyze it, properly analyzing it. That doesn't mean looking at splits. It doesn't mean drawing the red line on the map. Okay? It, it's thinking about what was I trying to do? Okay, and what did I do? And so the questions we always get people ask is, okay, the first question is, what was your plan? 
because athletes will never to be talk about what they did. So I don't care what you did. I want to know what you were trying to do in the first place. What was the plan? Step one. Okay. And quite often, like, they don't have one. It's like, well, okay, we don't need to talk about the rest of the leg. We can just talk about, okay, let's make a plan and just stop like that. Make a plan. Fine. Next control. Um, and then, okay, if they executed that, that's fine. So identify the positives. What did you do well? Okay, use that stuff in the future or understand that this is useful in this terrain. Um, and so you're building up a toolkit of things that you know you're good at or things you know that work in certain terrain. Um, and when things go wrong, it's about correcting it, understanding um, why mistakes happened. OK, and they go, right. And so now I'm going to do something different. And then that will affect your performance as well. So things you're going to repeat and things you're going to change. And um, a lot of people just go orienteering over and over and over and over again. And they don't spend the time. You wouldn't need to spend long. If you're orienteering for an hour, 15 minutes of good analysis is better than the hour of the orienteering itself. Um, I focus a lot on mistakes because I think it's easier to see when things have gone wrong. So here's a little little graph. I'm going to explain it. So. At any given moment, you can choose to do something or choose to not do something. Okay, so that's the horizontal axis. You can either be doing or you could be not be doing. Um, of the things you can be doing, some of them are going to be beneficial. Okay, checking your codes, you're doing something that's beneficial. Um, and some of the things you can choose to do could be harmful. They're going to um, or indifferent, to be honest, but they could be could be negative. So um, looking uh, at animals or picking berries, it's not particularly beneficial um to your orienteering okay so there's four places we can be hopefully we're up in that top white quadrant doing actions that are good for you i'm going to take a compass bearing great fantastic um so what we need to obviously avoid is not taking compass bearings okay um but you could actually also take a compass bearing but it's not a good one so you did something but that thing was detrimental so that's um yeah you've gone out of your way to do something unfortunately that was a bad thing um it's very hard to describe the bottom left because it's not doing harmful actions. You're either not taking bad compass bearings, okay, or not not taking compass bearings, which really doesn't make sense. Um, so we, we're not really thinking about moving into there. We want to move people up into that top right, okay? Now, this is totally different types of training, and it's really important you understand why you've made a mistake. There is a big difference between not taking a compass bearing and taking a bad compass bearing. OK, and you can think about this for all things, not taking a plan, making a good plan, not having a picture, having a bad picture. It's very important. And one of them is about concentration. This is about planning and concentration and focus and understanding that you need to do something. OK, this is more about planning. This is about the skill set. If you're taking your bearings and you know they're just bad, OK, go and practice and get better at that skill. Um, it's important to understand the difference um, between the two. So a practical example, this is, uh, what is this, Jaywalk Finland. So ideally you take a good bearing and you follow it. So um, the sort of greenish line going straight, that was Simona Abersold, unsurprisingly. Go straight, mm -hmm. nails it, wins Jaywalk for like the ninth time. Um, that's where you want to live. If we look at the pinky red one to the right, oh, that's a very straight line. It's a shame it's in the wrong direction. And so... <laughs> So it's important. That I, now, I'm obviously like I'm giving meaning to these routes. There could be many different reasons why these routes happen. But so that might be a person's like, oh, actually, you can follow a bearing, but maybe the way you set it wasn't good. If you compare that to the purple line, which starts off straight and then drifts, it's like, well, how many times did you recite? OK, and now these two examples and then yellow could be somebody who just didn't take a bearing because they change direction several times. They go straight, then they drift left, then they drift right, then they drift left. Um, so understanding it's like, do you need to uh, correct your bearing at the moment that you took it, the accuracy of that bearing? Or is it a matter of how many times you, you check your bearing along the way? Or is it a matter of not, not taking it? And this should then inform what you're going to do uh, next in your training. Very different for, the, for these types of mistakes. It's important to go through this analysis so then your training can be more informed, especially important in a season like this when we're getting much, uh, very not much training time, we're limited. So we need to be really efficient um, in what we do. Using mistakes to provide positive feedback. Um, analyzing mistakes is not negative feedback. So if you talk about negative feedback, all the research will say negative feedback is bad. If you look at it in teaching, if you look at it, um, one of the key papers was the Israeli Air Force teaching their trainer um, jet pilots and stuff like that. The negative feedback is, is not the same as looking at mistake. Um, analyzing mistakes to then come to 
some positive conclusion. That's positive feedback, something you can act. And negative is just essentially just uh, not bullying, but like just harassing someone and, and not, not giving them anything useful. Um, important thing to understand is time loss and mistake are not the same. People say I made a four minute mistake. No, 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 no. You made a three second mistake and you ended up lost for three minutes and, and 53 seconds. The mistake is, if we could think about that quadrant, it's either the thing you didn't do that would have enabled you to find that control or the thing that you did, but it wasn't good enough, which is the reason. That's the mistake. So it could be, um, I didn't take a bearing or I didn't recheck my bearing halfway along the leg um, or it could, you know, things like that. That's the mistake. And we think about that slide, there was some of the people were wondering about, that's time loss. Time loss is not a mistake. So don't worry about that. Three minutes or three seconds, the, the mistake may be the same. So it completely remove time loss from the equation. It's not important. Um, after analysis, you should have an actionable outcome. Okay, so what are you going to do next? So we, we know that you didn't take a compass bearing at this control. What are you going to do next? And we should be using positive language to describe these directions. So think about next time I'm going to do this. And what's that? Well, when there's a leg where it's vague all the way through the middle, that was just a, a, a sort of very shallow hill. I will take a compass bearing. Avoid saying, I'm going to not do that. Um, and psychologically, it's quite important. If you're setting yourself up, I'm going to try and do this. So it could be you think, oh, I'm going to check my compass when I'm exiting every control. OK, that's what I'm going to try and do. And when you go orienteering, you might do it seven out of 10 controls. That's great. Well done. Um, and, and you can measure some improvement. If you rephrase that in a negative way, um, you need to never leave a control without having checked your compass. If you ever leave a control without checking your compass, you failed. And, and you're setting yourself up for fa failure when you, when you think about it in that way, because as soon as you do that once, oh, I'm out, I did it. I did that bad thing. It's just a, ne a completely negative way of thinking about stuff. So it's like, try and do the positive thing. Don't think about being in that bottom left, double negative quadrant. It, that's not useful. Next time I'm going to do this. Um, now sometimes it can be complicated. The mistake could be I followed someone. So you go, just don't follow people. Yeah, and you always say like, don't follow people, sure. But what, what do you actually mean? It's like, focus on yourself, have your own plan. There's lots of ways of framing that positively. Any mistake you can make can be framed positively, something you can do next. And then try and link it back to your model of God orienteering or the athlete's model of God orienteering. What is useful for them? So questions you might want to ask is, if you're going to do this leg again, how would you rerun it to be successful? And you often find this, a small change can lead to minutes difference. So it could be, yeah, I should have just rechecked my compass halfway along. I was on top of the hill, I was on line, but I drifted. Make sure I recheck my compass. Um, and then, if, okay, what would you do in similar, similar legs in the future? So thinking about that leg and thinking about similar legs, because although every leg is different, really they're not. There's only so many types of legs that you can actually have and understanding what you need to do at certain times um, is important. I'm only six minutes over and Paul's still to go, but that is now <laughs> fortunately the end of what I'm going to do. Thanks for bearing with that. I'm now going to hopefully, oh, I've lost that part of the, I've lost the ability to give you sharing, change presenter, Murgatroyd. Yup. Sorry about that. That was a little bit long, but there we go. That's okay. Right. Um, let me just check that we're back on. Can we can we see that? Okay. Okay. So I, I'm going to try and keep this uh, short and sweet, so we don't overrun too badly, and we've got a little bit of time for final questions. So what I'm going to do with these these uh, last few slides. Firstly, I'm going to talk about um, how you might take this as a model, this, this macro strategy, micro strategy, and this systematic orienteering approach and start thinking about how you might apply it in your own coaching. So this, this is what we tend to do with the squad. So if you're working with an athlete or you're working with a group of athletes over a period of time, so it might be a regional squad, for instance, that you're working with, then what we can look at doing here is breaking these aspects down into a periodized plan. So those of you who were two years ago in my, in my talk when I, I, we looked at linear periodization, you'll have remember this slide from last time so within the squad what we do is we we compartmentalize it down into certain aspects that we're going to focus on at certain times so at the start of the season the base phase november through december that couple of months on the technical side uh, once we've done the review we've, we've created our plans in the first camp and we've identified, you know, what, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are we going to work on? This is our time that away from the main competitions, we can focus on developing the skills so we can 
do a lot of distance, direction, picture exercises. And that's underpinned by the other domains that we're, that we're also working on, where we're working on, for instance, with the physical, we're focused focus on developing a, an endurance base, getting in some good aerobic conditioning. And then there may be other things that we've, we've tutored them through our sports science workshops. So we're, we're giving them new skills, for instance, SNC lifting, imagery techniques, thinking about uh, good dietary plans. And this is, again, a good time to, to trial things when you're well away from your, your premier competitions. Now, um, in a normal year, what we'd be doing now is we'd be working through to our pre-season approach. So now we'd be starting to look at the plan style camps, putting things together. So taking these skills, putting them together, building solid plans over and over again and doing that systematic process that Mark was talking about. And the, the volume of training is just starting to come down and the intensity starting to move up as we prepare for the key races. Then we're into the competition period, we're into selection races, the, national, the key national races by the JK and the British, um, selecting our athletes to go overseas and then thinking about preparing for JWOC. And now we're talking about race preparation. The, the focus is very much on that kind of micro strategy of thinking about um, what are the challenges of each particular race, where it's a, a, a sprint on a university campus, whether it's a long race in a highly technical forest. We're, we're doing that geeking, we're doing that preparation, we're thinking about for ourselves as individuals, how are we gonna maximize our chances of success within those races, knowing what we know about ourselves. And then we go through the transition phase, we're down in tools, we're getting away from the sport, we're recharging the batteries, and we're starting to do that review process of reflecting on the season and where have we gotten to, and, and again, looking, thinking about for the next season, where are we at in our strengths? Where are we at with, with areas that we need to focus on next year? So that's what we can do as a long-term plan, a seasonal plan with athletes who are, who are uh, motivated and, and aspirational and working towards maybe national and international honours within our various squads. Now, some of you will be working as club coaches. So um, I'm just going to share you an example of what we've done with uh, Lincoln Orienteering Group. So it might be that you're a club coach, you're thinking about um, when we return, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, about starting up club night again. And this is some this is a model that I've adapted and, and fine-tuned over the six years I've been working alongside Mark. And so if I think of a typical example in the season, let's say for, for instance that we're running our spring series, normally kind of um, April, May time on a Thursday night. What we'd do in the build-up to that is we'd have a block of training working on this systematic orienting process. So um, over a six-week program, we'd go, right, week one, we're going to work on the whole. So we would run a typical course. We might set up a little green course uh, on one of our local areas. We'd get everybody to run with GPS. And then afterwards, we would undertake some analysis. Um, that might be a club get-together. Uh, we might do it via teams in the week. And we look at doing it through 3D rerun, um, quick route, route gadgets, something of that nature. And we go through that process of analyzing, as Mark says, analyzing what went well, why did it go well, what went wrong, and why did it go, go wrong? So getting to the heart of the matter, was it um, in the planning stage? So we didn't really weigh up the route choices, we didn't construct a good plan, the plan broke down halfway, or was it with the execution of the plan and is the problem with our skill set? So was it the bad compass bearings? Was it having a poor picture? That kind of thing. So we do the analysis and then we take that analysis into a block of training over the next few weeks. So we focus on working on the skills. So for instance, we might spend week two uh, working on direction exercises, working on compass. We might do some, some window exercises, that kind of thing. Week three, we could do some distance exercises, working in maybe a corridor style exercise. And then week four, uh, sorry, distance and then week four with some picture exercises, maybe some simplification or contour only, that kind of thing. And then once we've worked on the skills um, with the individuals involved, then we'd, we'd start putting these together. So this would be typically what we do um, with the guys in the squad at this time of the year. So we do exercises like Torco in pairs. So you, you're talking to your partner about what is my plan? What am I seeing? What's my route? 
what's my plan, talking step by step through that plan, building that buffer zone that Mark talks about, um, and using the skills. So what skills am I using now? Well, I'm on a compass until I can see the hill ahead of me. Um, map memories, also a good, good one for getting people to work on the plan. So they're breaking the plan down into three or four parts, hand the map over to a partner, and they try and run that, that uh, leg on map memory. And again, that's really working on consolidating a, a really good, strong plan that's uh, working on the key components, keeping things relatively simple. Then week six, uh, we put it all back together. We, we rerun the course from a few weeks ago, again with GPS, and we complete the analysis. And hopefully the guys, if they've, if they've been um, learning from the weeks two to five, if they've done their analysis and identified the mistakes from week one, then hopefully they, they can rerun it more successfully. And that gives them confidence that they then take into the summer series. Okay, and um, so the last slide on this, I guess, um, COVID has been extremely problematic for, for society and for our sport as a whole over the last year. And I guess the, the one thing about this is it, it also has given us, this trauma has given us an opportunity to think about the sport, the direction of the sport, of the sport, what we want to get out of it. And it's an opportunity maybe for a reset. So when we go back, is it possible to, to make changes some of, and, and, and overcome some of the issues that we've seen um, we discussed it right from the get-go there. So talking about can we get our clubs to start thinking more about having a training culture, moving away from just dedicating their efforts into events and thinking about how we can create a club night regular training opportunity for our members and our newcomers. And can we move towards this more consistent training environment where we're starting to think about, well, what are we doing? How are we doing it? Not just having the isolated skills or the or the whole exercises, but having the, the approach that potentially we talked about there um, with the Lincoln Orienteering Group as a, as a model. How do we develop more coaches? How do we upskill their knowledge base? How do we get them into a position that they're more confident to coach, not just within the tactical side of the sport, but also um, delivering support to their their athletes on a, on the physical domains, the, the the mechanical domains, the lifestyle domains. So that's that's a question for us as a as a coaching group, and then um, just mention the the FA. Some of you may may know the FA DNA project, and this was something that was set up around about ten years ago by the FA. And and what they what they've done with the DNA project is they've looked at um, within their academy structures. So taking uh, individuals from the age of fourteen through to the senior squad, making sure that when these these athletes come into the national squads, they're all being coached using the same language. So right from the get-go, if we think about an equivalent kind of DNA project for us, when they're coming into clubs and then working through regions and ultimately coming to, um, to the talent squad, um, if we're using the same language, if we're using the same approaches, then hopefully we don't see as many gaps in the knowledge base when these athletes get to working with, with myself and Mark at that national level. Um, that's an ambition that, that we've got. And, and there's a, hopefully there's a lot that we've thrown at you, a lot to think about, but um, we've, we've got some, some ideas there for you to, to take away and absorb into your own coaching practice, hopefully. So I'm gonna stop there. Peter, I don't know if we've had any questions or we wanna just open it up to the floor. Oops. I shall drop back on. Yes, there's been a couple of uh, a couple of questions came through. Very well timed one with your uh, the, the club night uh, example at, at Lincoln. Uh, Ian was just uh, Ian Henry was just asking uh, about any thoughts we could uh, use the approach um, can use this approach with uh, beginners. And then you started your uh, <laughs> your example. So that was very very well timed when that um, came through. Um, uh, and Helen asks if uh, if there's any, it would be good if coaches could uh, put titles of useful literature on the website. Um, but looking for some uh, looking for some recommendations. So uh, if there's any particular literature that we've got that we could um, we can send out afterwards and uh, have a think through that. There might, there might be some new literature appearing this year as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we, we are, Mark and I are currently working on um, editing a performance orienteering book, which um, uh, is, we're, we've sourced a number of con contributors to this within all those, those domains we talked about. So we've got people um, writing chapters currently, and we're hoping to put this together around Easter for publication later this year, which we hope will be a really valuable resource and support a lot of what we've talked about today with that total orienteering approach. Um, I mean, if people have got anything specific um, within those particular domains that they'd like to see, if they wanted to drop me or Mark a, a line, I'm, I'm happy to direct people to, to resources of, around specific areas. Mark, I don't know if you've got any, any thoughts on, on stuff there. No, I mean, yeah, you, it's just there's not many orienteering books out there, to be honest. The majority of what's published in the English language is it, books get published to make money and most books make a loss. Um, and so they're, not, they're normally designed for mass consumption. So it's very basic stuff. It's designed for schools because all school you can convince a, a county council to buy a lot of them. So in terms of performance, there's Thierry Georgiou's dad slash coach uh, has now been translated into English. And I believe it's, it's around somewhere. Uh, don't worry. It's called The Winning Eye. Um, I've not really delved too much into it. That, that's one of the few books which seems focused. Canada, Canadian Orienteering has got a, li a lot of good material uh, on their website as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think in general, it's just a good question about gathering resources into a place uh, for British Orienteering. Um, yes, Lynn mentions about be um, better orienteering as well at the moment. Um, that just that reinforces a lot that uh, has been said uh, through this evening. Um, quick one here is yes uh, about the slides as well about making uh, if we can get them available to everybody um, that would be great uh, Dan asks yeah uh, yeah there... oh sorry yeah I've read it so yeah anything specific you recommend for 3D 3D run through um, first thing I mentioned is the traps so uh, just because we can do stuff people really think about like what, what's the benefit of it and like having GPS watches and having 3D analysis or 3D rerun um, well the vogue produced software that people use but you have to ask it why are you looking at it and and the trap is quite often it it, it turns into another version of um getting your splits out just comparing splits it, it's just a it's a graphic representation of kind of showing off um and and, and we have to be very careful and, and we've learned through using it with the talent squad how we can use it use it best and we now actually encourage people to do their own gps using um, Quick Route, which is by Matt Turang, Swedish uh, national team coach, um, who also he wrote wind splits and, and and it's just them focusing on their route, getting them to think about their route. That's the most important thing. What 3D rerun provides is a comparison to other people, and you can learn a lot about the terrain. So we use it a lot, for example, when we're preparing for a competition that's important to us, i.e. Jaywalk, we'll go out the year before running that terrain. We can use it to find things like where is fast. So we might use it. You, analyze a route, see which way is quicker, and then, and then create a conversation. And I think that's a really important thing with this tool. It, the information you get just shows how far someone took to run which direction. But the question is, so what? And, and it should be used to create a, a stimulus for conversation. Why did you choose um, to go that direction? And, and why did the, the other person choose the slower one? And, and what did you see? And, and use it more, yeah, more for creating discussion rather than just showing who was the fastest on that leg, which is what juniors love to do. And so we personally really have to take them away from that and find something useful in that information that there's a way to it like i don't splits are useless as a coach splits mean nothing um and at least in the gps of their own gps is way more useful so i'd already say look at look at quick group first and then go to to, to group work but there's a time certainly for for 3d rerun yeah i i just add i just add into that that um i think when we've started using it as part of our um club night analysis um you know in week one and week six in the example i i showed i think it's really useful when we've got a group of of uploads to do that comparison of of, of routes as mark says not worrying so much about who who was faster because obviously within a club setting we've got a huge diversity of people um between ages of, of kind of nine through to 79 and so that that kind of split analysis is 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 a waste of time but actually getting them to look at a leg where they've made a mistake and drilling into the cause of well let's break this down where, where did the mistake occur was it in the drawing up of the plan or was it in the execution of the plan so somewhere along the line the skills went awry and that therefore is something for that person to focus on 
when we start working through weeks two to five. And that's that's how we've used 3D rerun and we've got a lot of use out of that. It's good. Good. A uh, question from uh, Nicola, uh, Mark, I you've seen this. Um, we are planning what virtual session um, we can undertake now. Any thoughts on how we build uh, systematic orienteering into these sessions? Um, they can't uh, actually practice or try yeah. it out. Yeah, so um, the process of reading maps can be done as we've done now, just looking at a screen. Selecting route choices can be done looking at a screen and building a plan can just be done looking at a screen or, or physically printing a map. Um, the, the execution obviously can't, okay? It's a struggle to get into range, so I appreciate that thing. I, th I think the execution's the easier bit. From, from, from the coaching I've done, I see way more mistakes in the planning stage than I do in the execution. Now, admittedly, I'm coaching the top juniors in the country, so that's it's a very biased population um, there. So obviously, I'm, I'm going to see people who actually their skills are reasonably robust. Um, but it, but it's such an important thing. I think it, it's it's far better to have a good plan and average skills than good skills and no plan. Um, I mean, you don't have to be the best whisker in the world to make a cake. But if you if you do it at the wrong time, it, it's not it's not a good cake. Um, and and so that that process can be done. And so what we've actually what I've been doing at Edinburgh for, for started last year, and what we've now rolled out with the talent squad, although I've not done it for this week, it's been a little bit busy with the conference, is each week we have a map of the week um, with a course and, and people go, and we, there's software which is called Running Wild, um, which is actually, it's, it's more like a route choice software, but what it does, it allows people to look at the leg orientated. And this is a very good piece of advice. If people are doing uh, this sort of uh, map preparation work digitally, orientate the map. It's really important that the map on your screen is orientated. If, it, if the leg's running horizontal, you don't look at it in the same way, and I don't think it's as good. It's, it's really important to orientate it, and this software does it for you, and people can draw their roots. But we want to get them to think about, okay, that's where you're going, but how are you going to do it? Um, so when we're doing it in, in like a classroom setting, we'll get people to talk about, okay, so where are you going? What are you going to see? And things like that. Drawing is another good way. Um, so just drawing drawing the key things. You're, so we talked about you know, using... Um, so waypoints, key things along the way. Okay, what are those and how are you traveling between them? So just drawing and it could be absolute scribble, but that process of thinking and then putting pen to paper um, can do that. And just making plans and plans and plans. And I recommend people spend a lot of time looking at maps, especially sprint. Um, it, it's important that you get sort of sprint map vision. It, it's a trainable skill. I remember reading a paper a long time ago, Manchester United have a vision coach. Football is really important. They need to, you need to know where people are. So it's part of tactics. You need to know where people are, but you need to be able to see things. And and I remember discussing with Gigi, who I think is in at the moment, um, the concept of like training your eyes. <laughs> and, and it's a thing. You can train your eyes, and, and you need to be looking at maps the whole time. It, by the, hopefully, we get some sort of season this year. Think about how many times, how many maps you've looked at, how many controls you've planned. And if it's low, that's your fault because the internet has got thousands and thousands i think we looked it up it was like over a hundred thousand maps on world of o at the moment maybe it was even more um so if you go to world of o you scroll down a bit people just upload maps the whole time you can go into their database and it's got every map that's ever been uploaded to that website and just what would i do ask yourself that question um and then you can discuss it in a group so if you're thinking about a club so we send the map and then a week later um well actually i'm sending a youtube video at the moment of like talking about okay this is what we see and we look at people's routes and have that discussion and again it's it's about creating a discussion so people think about things in a different, different way. But that's that's probably the easiest way of doing it digitally without being able to actually go and do the execution. But then you can practice compass bearings in your local park. Uh, setting a bearing and following it doesn't need to be anywhere difficult. So you can practice some extent um, the practical thing. And what you're left with there is just uh, visualisation. It's the only thing you need to do after that. Sorted. I've uh, got the last couple of questions. Uh, appreciate, obviously, just the time. So um, Roger just asked a couple. Um, that there's been uh, not many uh, mentions about attack points when, when you've been talking through. Um, and his other second question was, how do you persuade juniors to use events for training? Do I take the attack points one and Paul can talk about the using events yeah. one? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I didn't really mention it, but it, it, it's attack point is just part of your plan. And I think already it's called the wrong thing, attack point. How often do they point? So I have sort of attack areas or attack zones or attack lines. Um, the concept is solid, um, but actually also quite often legs have multiple attack points to one on the way. It's 
it's one of these skills or tactics, it's not a skill, it's a, it's a tactic or a strategy um, that has like, massively been bought into it. And, and it, I'm not saying it shouldn't have, but it's like, it, it's massively not overweighted, but it's like, I didn't use the word attack point, but I talked about attack points. I just never called them attack point. I talked about those key features along the way. So some people talk about like micro attack points. So your leg is actually attack point after attack point. You can think of your course just being a continuous line of attack points which are big, obvious features. Um, I assume everyone on this course call knows what an attack point is, so I'm not going to explain that. Like, and that's how we orient here. We're, we're essentially doing a line course through 100 odd attack points. And every five or so, that attack point is followed by a control. Um, I think it's a very important concept to teach beginners, for sure, absolutely. But the sort of overall strategy, or sort of the type of orienteering I'm talking about, it's kind of built into that planning stage. Um, it's almost got to a point where it's almost assumed. But very, very valid question. Like what I delivered tonight was massively condensed. The word attack point definitely gets used when we're <laughs> when we're doing doing training. But to me, it's part of the plan. It's how are you going to find the control? But which is also like how are you going to find the halfway point to the control and how are you going to find that? So it's sort of attached um, in that way, Roger. But good question. And Paul, you can take the uh, convincing juniors to utilize yeah. events. Yeah. Um, I mean, we it's part of, I guess. The issues that we discussed at the start of the the session with us having um a 52 weeks of the year event culture and it, it is really easy for athletes for juniors to jump in the car and go to yet another event and raz around the green the blue the brown whatever they're doing and then just go yeah i've, I've won that brilliant get back in the car and, and not give it a moment's thought and just keep doing that over and over and again without really buying into well, what are we what are we using these events for is what is the purpose and certainly within the squad it is something that we um with the 15 16 year olds we 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 hammer home within their first year or so within the squad that if whenever you step outside the door and you're going training there should be a purpose to it so if it's a if it's a physical training session what kind of physical training session is it? Is it is it an interval session um, that you're trying to develop your anaerobic capacity? Is it speed work? Is it strength and conditioning? You know, there should be there should be a goal and a purpose to each of those sessions. And it's the same when we orienteer. So if you are going to that that local event on the, the forest that you've run in 20 times before as a youngster, then what's the purpose of that? Is it are you going to run a course and if you're running a course what are you trying to get out of that and th this is where their relationship with a personal coach and if they're in the squad with their cluster coach is really important that they've discussed their plan for that phase of training and they're saying right i'm going to these events with a view that i'm doing race preparation or i'm going to work on compass today i'm going to treat every leg like a compass leg or i'm i'm going to talk to the organizer and see if i can get an all controls map and I'm going to generate my own exercise out of this so there's there's loads of things they can obviously do but Roger is right in terms of persuading juniors to park the ego forget about results forget about racing and, and beating everybody else who's running the blue but actually to say right I'm here for a purpose because this builds ultimately once they're in the squad we say to them look there's only two races that are important for you guys. One are the selection races, that's where you need to perform. And two, once you've been selected, the internationals. Everything else is training for those events. So always have a focus. When you're going to some event, what are you trying to get out of it? Brilliant. Um, I think we have got time for one last quick one that's coming from James. Um, do you see the emphasis between plan, picture, distance, etc., varying as juniors move from um, TD3 to TD4 and 5? Yeah, good question. Um, first thing I say is like I, I, I only teach experienced international uh, <laughs> juniors and young seniors, and so that I do not have experience of, of teaching people moving through the through the TD ages. So probably not the best person to really talk about that. But um, yeah, absolutely, because the the demands on those courses are different and. And really, you, we, you should really think about it from TD1 um, upwards, all, all the way through and connecting them. But yeah, certainly, if you think about the challenges, so TD3, I don't know, I, I can't remember the TD levels and what you're talking, but they're starting to 
go off the paths, right? That's orange courses. And and it, it's very different because there's a directions, okay? So they're gonna they're gonna have to leave the control in the right direction. So there's there's that direction, but they're not traveling cross country yet. And so there's exit direction, which is not the same as holding your line for 400 meters um, through some low visibility and, and you know maybe undulating terrain. So things become there's different even within that it, it, it's broken down. Um, planning is becomes more complicated, but it's important to hold it. Planning is important on a white, except your plan is punch turn left, punch turn right, or punch straight on. Those are the only th those are the only plans you can have on a white course, right? Because it has to be on every junction. And on yellow, it's punch, turn left, turn right, go straight on, and then maybe another left, right, or straight on, because there can only be so many decision points. And then, and then orange, it's like, okay, they're going to have to understand what their feature is on. So picture starts to come into it at TD3. Um, and then once you get to TD4, okay, we're starting to go cross country now. There's there's something that's collecting features and catching features, but they're going to have to be able to hold the right. I mean, TD3 to TD4 is huge. TD1, 2, 3 is quite linear. TD3 to TD4, T5 is massive. Um, I, I've not really answered the question at all, but yeah, they, they, do, <laughs> they do do that. What I actually need to do is like get some maps out and just say what what becomes more important. And you look at the course like what is important on this leg, and and, and sort of ask yourself that question. And it depends on the terrain. Bear in mind, you could argue that half the country doesn't even have TD five. So I'd say like a, a JK on cold dash is not TD five. Um, it's TD4, but that doesn't mean I'm, 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 I'm going through these questions. I'm using plan, direction, picture, distance, any different. I'm just this focus. I'm not going to have to use picture quite so much in the southeast. Um, and I could run like in somewhere like Loch Val without a compass. It wouldn't be a problem because the picture is like so. I think so that things have different priority in different terrains, but also different different TDs. But I think most important is look at a map and understand what the demands of this leg. And that tells you what the priority is rather than you can't go in saying oh it's an orange therefore i need to focus on this it, I, it's the I, leg and the terrain is dictated i i'd agree with you mark i think the emphasis does change and it's not necessarily as simple as saying it's it's td3 to four to five is 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 definitively at angle towards one over the other um i think what is important and this goes back a little bit to that kind of F, fa dna project is that Right from the get-go, as these guys come into the system, they're being they're talking the same language and they're 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 understanding um, what do we mean about building a plan? What what is a plan? How do you go about building it? Irrespective of whether it's a, a plan on a TD three, which may be just you know three three or four sides of a of, a, of a running down a tracks and maybe cutting in the odd corner or whatever, um, but they still need to be going through that systematic process of um building the plan having that clear and then using the skills to execute that plan and obviously that becomes more complex as they move from t3 to four to five but if they're all taught if they're taught in that that way then it becomes easier to transition through those 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 stages okay brilliant that's uh I have got no more questions through, uh, but I'd just like to say thanks for a, a great session. Um, that's been really interesting, and uh, uh, I've, there's been a few comments as well that have come in to say thank you very much. Uh, really interesting. Uh, a couple of emails already have, have fallen into my inbox about it, so uh, thank you very much for, for putting that together. And uh, yes, we'll we'll sort the uh, the slides out, and uh, we'll have this. Uh, We'll get the recording will be, be done uh, shortly as well because so i think not only will it be so interesting for those that uh, have been watching this evening as well but i'm sure there'll be lots um within clubs as well that'll be really intrigued to uh, to see that a bit further about um, improving their own skills uh, i certainly took a lot out of it um on a personal level as well um i just thank everyone else for uh, for tuning in uh, tonight I um, hope you will actually got as much out of it as, as uh, people have said so far. Um, next session will be on, on Thursday, so don't forget to register for that, and the information will uh, will come out to those that have registered already um, on Wednesday. Uh, but yeah, th thanks, Paul and Mark, and um, everybody have a, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. For... Cheers. Bye. Cheers, guys.